you have your Bibles, open up to Ruth, chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 18. As we start a new book. I don't have the clicker. There you go. Ruth is a book that's from providence to redemption as we go through the, the book here and learn of the, the story of Ruth. How we see how the, the, the book begins with, with heartache and with pain. But we see God's hand at work through His providence. It brings redemption to those who come back and turn back to Him. As we see, this is the overwhelming theme as we read the chapters in Ruth. So we're in Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. So before we begin, I'll just give you just a quick introduction. The, here at the beginning verses, it gives us an indication of the time period when these events happened. It says, and the days when the judges ruled. So if we turn back to the left a couple of pages, we come to the book of Judges. It's the book right before Ruth. And you see there at the last chapter in 21, in the last verse, the last verse of the book of Judges, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. There was no king. Every person did right by themselves. And doesn't that sound eerily familiar with the time that we're living in now? Everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Not according to God or His Word. They just do what they want. If it feels good, if it tastes good, then it must be good according to me. The Gospel according to me is the environment that we live in now. It's similar to where we find in Genesis chapter 6 and 5 in the story of Noah. Before God met out His justice and His punishment on a wicked and evil world. It says the law, in Genesis 6, 5 there, it says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention and thought of his heart was evil continually. All the time on man's heart was evil. So here, at the time of Judges, this was a desperate time for the people of Israel. So what do you do when you don't have a king? What do you do when you don't have a God? Or at least one that you don't acknowledge or worship? You do what's right in your own eyes. That's what you do. They did it then. And we can see that we're beginning to do that now in our own society. Ruth chapter 1 verses 1 through 18 says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Malone and Kilion, and they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the other was Ruth. They lived there for about ten years, and both Malone and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited His people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with me, or if you dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they say, said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your own way, for I am too old to have a husband. 
If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and bear sons, would you therefore wait till they are grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for is it exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me? Then they lift up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more. So we go back and look at verse 1 as we begin to break down what's going on here. It says, In the day when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. A man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So we're told that there was a great famine in Israel. It was so great that it caused this family to decide to pack up and leave. A man of Bethlehem, it says. When we read the Old Testament, it's vital that we recognize the nuances that the Hebrew language has. This is why it's important to study the biblical languages if it's possible for you. In Hebrew, when something is named, there is usually some significance behind it. Many of our names mean something in the original language that they've come from, but to us it's just a name. Many of us don't even know what our name means from the original language. But in Hebrew, it all came from something. For instance, the name Esau, it means hairy. And we learned out throughout his life he was a hairy man. So he was a hairy baby, so that's what they named him. They named him Harry. And his brother, his name Jacob, it meant heel grabber. And it was a Hebrew idiom, it meant deceiver. So at birth, this is what they called them. So when their parents called them, that sounds Esau, that's not a name, but they were literally calling him, hey, Harry, come over here. Or, hey, hill grabber, it's time to eat. Their names meant something. It had significance behind them. And here we're told this man is from Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem in Hebrew, it means house of bread. So here's the irony. The house of bread no longer has bread, is what we're told here. There's a great famine God had warned the Israelites in Leviticus, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 that if they fell away, if they turned away from him and started worshiping other gods, this was exactly what was going to happen. He would bring famine on their land and he would punish them. The house of bread no longer had bread. This was the promised land that God had told them about when he brought them out of bondage from Egypt. This was supposed to be the land flowing with milk and honey. The land I'll give to you and your ancestors, and you will multiply and become a great nation. You will be my people, and I will be your God. But there's no more milk. There's no more honey. There's no more bread. So they pack and they leave. And they go sojourn in the land of Moab. That word sojourn, it has the idea of meaning living as an alien among people, as a stranger. They decided to leave the comfort of their own home, their God, their land, and they thought it better to go live as strangers in someone else's land. As we'll learn in a few verses here, it also has the impression to mean temporary. So we're going to go sojourn Maybe just for a short period of time. And as we learn here in a few verses, they were gone for more than 10 years. When we leave the house of God for whatever reason, when we decide that God's provisions are no longer good enough for us, that we're going to go seek more elsewhere, it's 
school's going to take me away. My family's going to take me away. My work's going to take me away. I have to so sojourn away for a short period as I handle these things. And then the next thing you know, 10 years have passed that you've been gone. Ten years away from church, or ten years away from godliness and right living. We shouldn't let the ebbs and flows of life let us sojourn away from God and His will on our lives. So the man takes his wife and his two sons, and they leave to Moab. Just to mention in passing kind of a back story on Moab. Throughout the law, this was a land forbidden. The Israelites were not supposed to interact with the Moabites. They were evil people. They did wrong by their country. They treated the Israelites harshly. If we remember the story of Lot, Abraham's nephew, and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, God was going to destroy that city because of its wickedness. So the angel of the Lord gets Lot and his family out, and he says, don't turn around and look back. But we know his wife turned and looked, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. So it was Lot and his two daughters that fled the city. And his two daughters says, well, look at us. It's just us now. Where's our line going to go? So they got their father intoxicated, and they had an incestuous relationship with their own father. And the oldest daughter gave birth to a son. And his name was Moab. This is the Moabites, where they came from. They were the relation of an incestuous relationship between Job and his oldest daughter. And now they were enemies of Israel. The Israelites were forbidden to interact with them. But Elimelech says, let's go there. When we sojourn away from God, we will always end up exactly where we're not supposed to be. Verse 2, it says the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. The name of his two sons were Malone and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went into the country of Moab and remained there. His name's Elimelech. That means my God is king. This was his name. Yet they lived in Israel where there was no king. Where everyone did was right in their own eyes. The man whose name, my God is king, lived in a place called the house of bread. Turns to his wife and kids and say, let's leave this land that has no king. And this city that has no bread. This man truly did do what was right in his own eyes. His wife's name was Naomi. It means pleasant. And they had two sons. Malone, it means sickly. And Kilion, it means weak or frail. Those are some names to live with the rest of your life with. Later on in life, when it came to be married, as their mother presented them to the ladies of the town, here, ladies, these are your two choices, sickly or weakling. Which one do you want? Maybe some of you are sitting there wondering which one you ended up with. <laughs> they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem. Which means this was a region around Bethlehem. So they leave Bethlehem where there was no king. The man whose name my God is king says we have no king. And the city of the house of bread says there is no bread. So they leave Bethlehem. And if we remember our history, a few generations after this, the greatest king in Israel's history was born there, and David. And we know this is where the king of kings would eventually be born. And a little over a thousand years after this time. But they leave the land with no king. And they go settle in Moab. Verses 3 through 5. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. 
And she's left with her two sons. They took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah. The name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. And both Malone and Kilion died. So that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. The story changes quickly. Elimelech died, leaving Naomi a widow. Then her two sons married Moabite women, which was forbidden. Orpah and Ruth. And then ten years passed, and both sons died, leaving all three of the women on their own. Now Naomi was a foreign land with no husband and no sons. She's now childless and vulnerable. She has no way of supporting herself. To her, there's no more hope. Hope is gone. But we know Paul tells us in Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. God makes hope where there is no hope. He makes a way where there is no way. Despite all these things, God was at work. God allowed their defiance in leaving the promised land to work together for his good. God can use suffering for his redemptive purposes. God allowed their dire circumstances and even death to work together for his good. He'll use suffering for his redemptive purpose. And sometimes we can't see his providence at work. Sometimes we can't see his redemptive purposes at work. Sometimes all we see is the hurt. All we see is the pain. And sometimes that's all he allows us to see. Because he's a test, as we learned as we went through James and some of the verses we read in Peter, not to be surprised at this suffering and these tests. Because they allow us to prove ourselves. So after all this suffering, God says, will suffering drive you back to me? Will all the pain in your life drive you back to God? Jesus tells us, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, come to me. I give you rest. That's where we find our rest. The burden of suffering and hurt and the burden of sin and death, it weighs on us and it feels like we're drowning sometimes. Jesus says, come to me. I'm gentle and I'm meek. My burden is light. Come and find rest for your souls. Are you weary and heavy laden? Are you carrying around the burden of sin in your life? The burden of loss? The burden of suffering and sorrow? Naomi was. So what did she do about it? In verse 6, it says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. It says that she arose in order to return home, to return back to her God. The Hebrew word used for return here, it's the main word used throughout the Old Testament for meaning turning back to God's covenant grace and for mercy and for repentance and conversion. This is the word that's used over and over again for those who turn to God for repentance, turn to God for conversion. And throughout the rest of chapter 1, it's translated as either return, turn back, gone back, or brought back. It's all the same word. And it's used in verses 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16, 21, and 22. For the rest of the chapter, it's used 10 times between verses 6 and 22. These were grammatical devices that the writer would use to get the reader's attention. He's saying, hey, you see what's going on here? Look. Look what God is doing. 
Look how God's hand is at work here. She's returning. They left God's covenant. They left God's grace. They left family and home and the promises of God because they did what was right in their own eyes. But the writer's saying, but now look in all of her suffering, in all of her pain, through all of her losses, she's turning back to the covenant grace of God. She's returning back to God. This first chapter in Ruth is very similar to the parable of the prodigal son. The father's house, what God has given, wasn't good enough. I need to go elsewhere and find something else. And what's very similar in both cases is that it took the loss of everything in order for them to realize that the only thing that they had left was the only thing that they ever needed in the first place. And that was the Father. It was God. In Matthew 6.33, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. First. Seek God first, not second or third or fourth or last. Don't go through all of the plans that you have in your head, and if it doesn't work out, then you go to God. He says, seek God first. Why do we have to keep learning this the hard way? Come to Him first. Naomi heard that God had visited His people and given them food. The Hebrew word for food is lahem, and it literally means bread, as in Beth lahem. God has returned and given bread back to the house of bread. The house of bread was once again restocked. The nation that had no king was visited by the king. And the house that had no bread was given bread. The writer saying, look at how God works in our lives. His providence makes all things work together for His good. For His redemptive purposes. Verses 7 through 10, it says, So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant that you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. So they set out to return to Judah. And somewhere along the way, Naomi says to her two daughters-in-law, You guys should go back to your mother's house, to your own people. Now it appears that Naomi's not being a very good evangelist here. A very good witness. She says, I'm returning to my people. I'm going to return to my land. And I'm going to return to my God. And you guys should do the same. Go back to your people. Go back to your land. Go back to your gods. And then she gives them some parting words. The, deal, the Lord deal with you kindly. And then essentially she says, the Lord grant you rest and the house of your new pagan husband. That's not how God's blessings work. Go enjoy your paganism and your worshiping of false gods, and I pray that the Lord blesses you for it. That's not how any of this works at all. You need to be in God's covenant grace to enjoy His blessings. I wonder if Naomi's coming to the realization that she's in the wrong place and she's mixed up with all the wrong people and she's just trying to shed her past by any means necessary before she makes it back to Bethlehem.
because it's not going to look very good when she comes strolling back home with some Moabite pagans in trail with her. But sometimes that's what we need to do. In order to escape the sinful life we're living, we have to cut ties with the people that's in it. I'm turning my life over to God. And I'm sorry, but you guys have to go. I can't be a part of this any longer. If this is the life that you're going to continue to lead, then it's best that you go back to your own home and to your own people. And this can be a painful experience when we cut ties with people that we love. As we see there in verse 9, they lifted up their voices and they wept. They've been together for 10 years. They've lived together. They're family. But it's time to part ways because I'm going home to my God. Cutting ties with loved ones hurts. But you always have to do what's in the best interest of you and your family when it comes to following God. Jesus tells us that he didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring a sword. And that sword sometimes severs ties and relationships with people that we should no longer have relationships with. I don't care how long they've been your friend. I've been friends with a person from third grade. What difference does that have to do with you and your relationship with God? In Hebrews 11, it says that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And we know in John's prologue to his gospel that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. The spoken and written Word is Jesus Christ. He's that sword. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it should be, because it pierces our hearts. When we read and study the Word of God, it says it cuts down to the bone and to the marrow. And that's what it's supposed to do. God's Word's supposed to convict us. If you read and study God's Word and you listen to God's Word and it doesn't convict you, then you're not a part of God. That's the easiest way to find out where you're at. If you read God's Word and it doesn't convict you of your sin, then you're not saved. Verses 11 through 15. Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that should become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they are grown? Would you therefore remain from marrying? No, my daughters, it is exceedingly bitter to me. For your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Her arguments are legit here. There's no reason to come with me. I can't give you another husband. I don't have any more children to give to you. And even if I could conceive tonight, are you going to wait another 20 years until this son is of a Marian age? There isn't any more that I can give you. And she says, it's more bitter for me that this happened. Because God has turned his hand against me. So here we see Naomi's disposition toward her lot in life is now exposed. She's a bitter old woman who blames God for her crisis. She feels that she's the target of God's overwhelming power and wrath in her life. Yet she's the one. Her and her family left Bethlehem. They left the promised land. They left the covenantal grace of God, and they went to a place God forbade them to go, and they intermarried with people they were not allowed to. Yet it's God's fault that all these bad things are happening in her life. Instead of repenting for her sins and for her people's sins, she accuses God for injustice towards her. 
Have you ever been there? Have you ever blamed God for not being there? When you've never even invited Him to be there in the first place? God, why is there so much chaos and dysfunction in my home with all my children? Has God ever been invited into your home? Has He ever been introduced to your children? Have you ever introduced your children to God? God, why is my marriage suffering? It's on the brink of collapse. Has God ever been invited into your marriage? Or better yet, is He the center of your marriage? Because that's how the Christian marriage works. God is at the center of our marriage. It revolves around Him. And we put Him first. We pray together as husband and wife. We study the Word of God together. Christian husbands, you are the priests of your home. It's up to us to lead our families in the Word of God. God calls us to do it. Us to lead. We blame a lot of things on God when we never let Him work in our lives in the first place. And this is where Naomi's at right now. I'm bitter because of the way God has dealt with me. Bitter is okay. God can work with bitter. He can work with broken. He can work with weary. He can work with wretched and sinful. Because you know what all these things are better than? Forsaken. And He promises that He'll never leave us or forsake us. When we turn our backs on Him, sometimes He does deal bitterly with us. But He never leaves us or forsakes us. And that should be a comforting thought to each one of us. The wretched people that we are. We curse God. We blame Him for all the problems in our life. Yet He never leaves us. If somebody used some of the language used towards God, if they used them towards us, we'd turn around and walk out the door. Shake our dust off of our feet as we left. Yet God is always there. And they cry out and they weep again. And Orpah kisses her goodbye. But it says Ruth clings to her. Or in the King James, she cleaves. It's the same word used in Genesis 2.24. When a man shall leave his father and mother and cling or cleave to his wife. It means to be united to or to be bound to. And Ruth shows her true character now for the first time. She's saying we're bound together. I'm not going back to that pagan land. I'm not going back to those pagan people even if they are my family. I'm not going back to those pagan gods. I'm leaving that life behind and I'm going with you. Naomi attempts to convince her one more time to go. Go back to your people and to your gods just as your sister-in-law. And then we see in 16 through 18. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where I die, where you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and even more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go, she said no more. Again, Ruth shows her true character here. And she gives one of the greatest speeches in all of Scripture when she makes her confession of faith. Don't urge me to go back to a pagan life. Where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. This is the very true meaning of clinging and cleaving. She's saying from now on we are inseparable. We are united forever, for the rest of our lives. We are bound together. Your people, 
are my people. Your God is my God. I'm one of you now. Here, Ruth makes a profession of faith. She leaves the pagan gods of her homeland, and she says, your God is my God now. I believe in the God of Israel. I believe in the one true God. That God is now my God. And just as a husband leaves and cleaves, Ruth makes the same commitment to Naomi. She says, only death will separate us. Where you're buried, that's where I'm going to be buried. And when Naomi saw her determination and she saw her faith, she didn't ask her to leave anymore. God can use famine. He can use suffering and bitterness. He can use death in order to fulfill his redemptive plan. He can use those who fall away only to bring them back. Those who sojourn away from his very presence, he calls us to turn back. Those who backslide away. And he can even call to himself those who never knew him in order to fulfill his plan. And God can use you too, wherever you fall on that spectrum. And we have three people, the three major characters in this story here. As we go further, there's Naomi, there's Ruth, and there's Boaz. When we learn of Boaz, he was a man of God who never fell away. Naomi was a person of God who fell away and then returned back. And then Ruth was somebody who never knew God until she came to faith in him. Everybody falls somewhere on that spectrum. And God can use you wherever you are. And as we move forward in this story, we're going to see that God uses all three of those people who will eventually become the ancestors in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The three people that we learn about in the book of Ruth are direct ancestors to King David and then eventually to our Savior. The three people that God uses, the person who is always in faith, the person who backslides from their faith and returns to God, and the person who was a pagan that came to faith in God. And he used all three of those to bring forth the birth of his son in order to redeem us back to him. God can use all of us, whoever you are, wherever you are, God can use you too. You just have to turn back to him. Because we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. If you put your faith and trust in Christ, then you are called according to his purpose. And if he's called you, then he has a purpose for you. Let's pray.